So the question is not whether entrepreneurship is right for you, but rather, are you right for entrepreneurship? Can you handle the stress, the freedom, the lack of structure, the uncertainty, and the opportunity that awaits you if you decide to start your own business? This really can't be emphasized enough. While there is no doubt that being in business for yourself can be great, if you are not temperamentally cut out for it, it will be a tough road. There is no shame in this. Some people are artists and others are lawyers. Some are vagabonds and others are homebodies. Some are entrepreneurs and some are not. So which are you? Taking the following quiz will help you evaluate your qualifications. The important thing though, as you take the quiz, is to be perfectly honest. There is no point in answering the questions right if they are not true for you. Test your entrepreneurship IQ. Number one, are you a self-starter? A, yes, I like to think up ideas and implement them, five points. B, if someone helps me get started, I will definitely follow through, three points. And C, frankly, I would rather follow than lead, one point. But of all the necessary traits, the one that you must have in abundance is a tolerance for risk because starting your own small business is a risk. Borrowing money, setting up shop, trying out new ideas, these are things that, while fun and exciting, are also inherently risky. There are no guarantees that your idea and plan will fly. Certainly the goal of this audiobook is to make sure it does, but no matter how much you study and learn, there will always be an element of risk in being an entrepreneur. Would you have it any other way? If your answer is no, then you definitely have the right stuff. If it is not, if the idea of taking a big risk scares more than excites you, then you need to consider carefully whether starting your own business is really for you. Throughout this audiobook, I share with you the traits of exceptional small businesses so that you can see what the best of the best do. Here is the first one and it is good news. Great small businesses work to reduce their risks as much as possible. They work at covering every angle so that the risks they take are prudent, calculated ones. That is what you will need to do too if you start your own small business. Take a prudent, calculated, intelligent risk with a high likelihood of payoff. Just know that even reduced risk will still be present because it is the nature of the game. The next step. Sometimes the idea of starting your own business can be overwhelming. What kind of business should you start? Where will you get the money? How will you find customers? All are legitimate concerns, and all are addressed in detail. At this point, however, understand that as you drive down the street, almost every business you see is a small business run by someone who at some point had never run a business before either. But they learned how, found the money, found some customers, and are still around. If they did it, so can you. To join their ranks, you must be willing to do your homework. Education. The next step, therefore, is to educate yourself. Most people go into business because they love something and want to do it every day. The baker wants her own bakery, the chiropractor wants to start his own practice, and so on. 16. Are you flexible and willing to change course when things are not going your way? A. Yes. Five points. B. I like to think so, but others may disagree. Three points. C. No, I have a fairly rigid personality. One point. 17. Do you have experience in the business you are thinking of starting? A. Yes. Five points. B. Some. Three points. C. No. One point. 18. Could you competently perform multiple business tasks? accounting, sales, marketing, and so on? A. I sure would like to try. Five points. B. I hope so. Three points. C. That sounds intimidating. One point. 19. Are you willing to really hustle for clients and customers? A. Sure. Five points. B. If I have to. Three points. C. I would rather not. One point. 20. How well do you handle pressure? A. Quite well. Five points. B. 
It's not my strongest trait, but I can do it. Three point. C. Not well at all. One point. Scoring. 80 to 100. You have both the temperament and the skills to become an entrepreneur. 60 to 79. You are not a natural entrepreneur, but may become one over time. Below 60, you would be wise to think of something else to do besides self-employment. So there you have it. Not only should this quiz help you understand your entrepreneurship IQ, but it should equally give you some insight into traits and characteristics of the prototypical successful self-employed business person. Driven, hardworking, creative, energetic, resourceful, confident, and flexible. So if this describes you, or a close approximation of you, then the next question is, where do you go from here? Risk Tolerance The quiz you just took is intended to both help you gauge your entrepreneurship IQ and show you the traits required to start your own small business. Yes, you will need some business savvy and self-confidence, that is a given. Being creative and hardworking are equally important. Two, how do you feel about taking risks? A, I really like the feeling of being on the edge a bit. Five points. B, calculated risks are acceptable at times. Three points. C, I like the tried and true. One point. Three, are you a leader? A, yes. Five points. B, yes when necessary. It's three points. And C, no, not really. One point. Four. Can you and your family live without a regular paycheck? A. Yes, if that's what it takes. It's five points. B. I would rather not, but understand that may be part of the process. Three points. C. I do not like that idea at all. One point. Five. Could you fire someone who really needed the job your business provided? A. Yes, I may not like it, but that is the way it goes sometimes. Five points. B. I hope so. Three points. C. I really can't see myself doing that. One point. Six. Are you willing to work 60 hours a week or more? A. Again, if that's what it takes, yes. Five points. B. Maybe in the beginning. Three points. C. I think many other things are more important than work. One point. Seven. Are you self-confident? A. You bet. Five points. B. Most of the time. Three points. C. Unfortunately, that is not one of my strong points. One point. Eight. Can you live with uncertainty? A. Yes. Five points. B. If I have to, but I don't like it. It's three points. C. No. I like knowing what to expect. One point. Nine. Can you stick with it once you have put your mind to something? A. I usually will not let anything get in the way. Five points. B. Most of the time, if I like what I'm doing. Three points. C. Not always. One point. Ten. Are you creative? A. Yes, I do get a lot of good ideas. Five points. B. I can be. Three points. C. No, not really. One point. Eleven. Are you competitive? A. To a fault sometimes. Five points. B. Sure, mostly. Three points. C. Not really. My nature is more laid back. One point. Twelve. Do you have a lot of willpower and self-discipline? A. Yes. Five points. B. I am self-disciplined when I need to be. Three points. C. Not really. One point. Thirteen. Are you individualistic or would you rather go along with the status quo? A. I like to think things through myself and do things my way. Five points. B. I am sometimes an original. Three points. C. I think strongly individualistic people are a bit strange. One point. 14. Can you live without structure? A. Yes. 5 points. B. Actually, the idea of living without a regular job makes me nervous. 3 points. C. No, I like routine and structure in my life. 1 point. 15. Do you have 
many business skills? A. Yes, I do, and those I don't have, I'll learn. Five points. B. I have some. Three points. C. No, not really. One point. If their thinking is limited, so is their potential. But if people can keep growing in their thinking, they will constantly outgrow what they're doing. Good thinking produces more good thinking if you make it a habit. Albert Einstein observed, the solutions to the problems we face today cannot be solved on the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. Look around you and you'll see that it is true. The world keeps getting more and more complicated. The good news is that no matter how complicated life gets or how difficult problems may seem, good thinking can make a difference if you make it a consistent part of your life. The more you engage in good thinking, the more good thoughts you will continue to think. I believe that good thinking isn't just one thing. It consists of several specific thinking skills. Becoming a good thinker means developing those skills to the best of your ability. In Built to Last, Jim Collins describes what it means to be a visionary company. He describes these companies this way. A visionary company is like a great work of art. Think of Michelangelo's scenes from Genesis on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel or a statue of David. Think of a great and enduring novel like Huckleberry Finn or Crime and Punishment. Think of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Think of a beautifully designed building like the masterpieces of Frank Lloyd Wright. You can't point to any one single item that makes the whole thing work. It's the entire work. All the pieces working together to create an overall effect that leads to enduring greatness. Jack responded. The first thing you must understand is the importance of getting out of the pile. The only way you are going to stand out to your boss is to understand this simple principle. When your boss asks you a question, assigns a basic project, or sends you out to gather some data, you must understand that your boss already knows the answer that he's looking for. As a matter of fact, in most cases, he simply wants you to go out and confirm what he already believes is true in his gut. Most people simply go out and do just that, Jack continued, confirm what their boss believes to be true. But here is the difference maker. You must understand that the question is only the beginning. When your boss asks you a question, that question should become the jumping off point for several more ideas and thoughts. If you want to elevate yourself, you must sink your thoughts and time into not only answering the question, but going above and beyond it to add value to the train of thought your boss was on. Practically speaking, that means coming back to the table and presenting to your boss not only an answer, but three or more other ideas, options, and perspectives that were probably not previously considered by your boss. The goal is to add value to the idea and the thought by exceeding expectations when the question is given to you. This is true not only with questions, but assignments, initiatives, and everything else ever given to you to run with by upper management. Those words were often quoted to me by my father, Melvin Maxwell. They were important to him because he is an example of someone who changed his thinking and therefore changed his life. If you met my dad, he would tell you that he was born with a naturally negative bent to his thinking. In addition, he grew up during the Depression, and when he was six years old, his mother died. But as a teenager, he began to see that all the successful people he knew had one thing in common. Their lives were filled with positive thoughts about themselves and others. He desired to be successful like them, so he embarked on the daily task of changing his thinking. He became a college president and touched the lives of innumerable people. To this day, he is my hero. Changing from negative to positive thinking isn't always easy, especially if you're someone who has a difficult time with change. For some people, it's a lifelong struggle. Good thinking creates the foundation for good results. If you don't like the crop you're reaping, you need to change the seed you're sowing. When it comes to achievement, the seed is your thinking. Good thinking increases your potential. If your thinking shapes who you are, then it naturally follows that your potential is determined by your thinking. Achieving your potential comes from making progress, and progress is often just a good idea away. That was certainly true of Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. He explained, 
I guess in all my years, what I heard more often than anything was, a town of less than 50,000 people in population cannot support a discount store for very long. But Walton did not think the way his competitors thought. And for that reason, his potential was greater. Today, Walmart is the world's largest retailer, employing more than one million people and achieving annual sales in excess of $191 billion. Every week, more than 100 million customers visit Walmart stores. For many people, the greatest detriment to their success tomorrow is their thinking today. When it comes to making positive personal changes, do you know what most people's number one challenge is? It's their feelings. They want to change, but they don't know how to get past their emotions. But there is a way to do it. Take a look at the truth contained in the following syllogism. Major premise. I can control my thoughts. Minor premise. My feelings come from my thoughts. Conclusion. I can control my feelings by controlling my thoughts. If you are willing to change your thinking, you can change your feelings. If you can change your feelings, you can change your actions. And changing your actions based on good thinking can change your life. Becoming a better thinker is worth your effort because the way you think really impacts every aspect of your life. It doesn't matter whether you are a business person, teacher, parent, scientist, pastor, or corporate executive. Good thinking will make you a better business person, teacher, parent, scientist, pastor, or corporate executive. Ask yourself this thinking question. Do I believe that good thinking can change my life? Take the next step toward understanding good thinking. Who are the best thinkers you know? Name them. What separates them from the rest of the crowd? Describe what's different about them. Choose one of those thinkers and try to arrange to spend some time with him or her. Who you associate with matters. In the past, how would you have defined good thinking? How would you describe it now? What personal or professional issues have created ongoing obstacles to your progress? Don't try to solve them now. Simply describe them on a piece of paper or at your computer. Chapter 2. Realize the impact of changed thinking. It's easy to believe that unsuccessful people need to change their thinking. But how about people who have already achieved a degree of success? Can individuals go to the next level without changing the way they think? Karen Ford didn't set out in life to be a business person or an entrepreneur. She started out as a teacher. For 10 years, she taught second grade and she was a good teacher. But when her second child was born, he was diagnosed with a heart condition that required him to receive medication every four hours, every day for a year. So Karen left her job and stayed home to take care of her son. That put her family in a bit of a financial bind. Good thinking is similar. You need all the thinking pieces to become the kind of person who can achieve great things. Those pieces include the following 11 skills. Seeing the wisdom of big picture thinking. Unleashing the potential of focused thinking. Discovering the joy of creative thinking. Recognizing the importance of realistic thinking. Releasing the power of strategic thinking. Feeling the energy of possibility thinking. Embracing the lessons of reflective thinking. Questioning the acceptance of popular thinking. Encouraging the participation of shared thinking. Experiencing the satisfaction of unselfish thinking. And enjoying the return of bottom line thinking. As you become acquainted with each skill, you will discover that you do some well and others you don't. Learn to develop each of these kinds of thinking and you will become a better thinker. Master all that you can and your life will change. Gabe Lyons, an Enjoy Vice President, recently attended an event at the Fox Theater in downtown Atlanta and came back completely on fire with enthusiasm. The speaker for the occasion was Jack Welch, former CEO of General Electric. Jack Welch came to promote his book, Jack, Straight from the Gut, but he didn't read from the book or give a canned lecture. He did something much more valuable for his audience. He answered their questions. Gabe said, a young guy asked, when you were my age, what did you do that elevated yourself among all of your other associates? 
How did you stand out in the crowd of all of the other young, ambitious, and driven colleagues of your day? Chapter 2 Choosing the Right Business The road to happiness lies in two simple principles. Find what it is that interests you and that you can do well, and when you find it, put your whole soul into it. Every bit of energy and ambition and natural ability you have. It's a quote by John D. Rockefeller III. When it comes to choosing a small business, there basically are two types of entrepreneurs. The first is the person who is in love with the idea of starting a very specific business. It may be a gardener who envisions a nursery or a chef who has long dreamed of owning a restaurant. The other potential small business person is someone who is also in love, not with a specific idea per se, but with the idea generally of being his or her own boss. As there are both risks and rewards associated with each path, both warrant further discussion. If you do what you love, will the money really follow? There is a saying that goes, do what you love, the money will follow. While noble and possibly true, there is more to small business success than simply doing what you love. Now, do not get me wrong. Doing what you love is indeed the first prerequisite when you are choosing the right business. But it is just that, a first step. Live with passion. What do you love? As in the rest of life, we tend to succeed when we are engaged in something that we really enjoy. Your business should be no different. Richard Branson started Virgin Music not because he thought music would be hot, but because he loved it. Bill Gates started Microsoft because he loved computers. Both companies began as small businesses. What about you? By now, you know what excites you, what you love most. You know what you like to do, what your passions are, what is fun, and how you like to spend your time. Barbara Winter, in her great book, Making a Living Without a Job, published by Bantam in 1993, says that passion leads to purpose. That once you get in touch with those things you are most passionate about, you can begin to create a business of purpose around them. So that is your first assignment, deciding exactly which of your passions you love enough to start a business around. Remember, your business will become your baby, and like any other baby, it will require a lot of love, time, money, and attention, if it is to grow strong and healthy. Of those, right now, you should be most concerned with time. Your new business will take a lot of it. Second, once you know what area you love enough to spend all the day, every day doing, you then need to figure out what business you could start that relates to that. Say, for example, that you have a lot of plants and gardening and have decided that you want to spend every day doing something related to those things. What are your choices? You could, for instance, start a nursery, open a flower shop, start a lawn care business, grow organic vegetables, buy a farm, start a winery. Stuck for a business that relates to your passion? Open the yellow pages and look under your category. You might be surprised to see how many different sort of businesses other people have created around the same thing. This is the time for one of those anything goes brainstorming sessions. Go for it. Write down any kooky idea you have. No limits. There are a few times in life when the stars align themselves just so and one has a chance not only for a fresh start but a fresh start completely of one's own choosing. Usually, either money is tight, or the opportunity passes, or something else conspires to interfere with a brand new beginning. But if you are at a place where you are reading this and are ready to start your own business, and you have the wherewithal to do so, and you can choose any business you want, then savor this moment, for it is rare indeed. But while it is good and wise to let your mind roam, it is equally shrewd afterward to come back to Earth. What if, instead of gardening, your answer is that what you love most is 19th century Flemish architecture, and that you have decided to become a Flemish architecture consultant? However interesting that may be to you, and while it certainly would scratch your Flemish architecture itch, if there are not people willing to pay you for your expertise, people willing to buy the product or service you want to sell, you do not have a business, you have a bust. 
So be realistic. The problem the baker and the chiropractor usually have is that while they may know a lot about baking and backs, if they are like most entrepreneurs, they know little about the business and boardrooms. They may know their specialty, but they do not know everything else it takes to start and run a successful business. And problematically, it is the everything else that will take up a lot of their time. Marketing and advertising, sales and income taxes, hiring and firing and so on have nothing whatsoever to do with backs and bread. There are several great sites that can teach you a lot about small businesses. www.usatoday.com slash money slash small business slash front dot htm www.nase.org www.nfib.com www.sba.gov www.microsoft.com slash small business www.mrallbiz.com So the next step is to begin to learn about business in general. Certainly this audiobook should be enormously helpful and down the road you will see that nothing beats the trial and error of actually running your own venture. But before you can get to that point, you need to get a general idea of how businesses operate. Even if you have passed the preceding entrepreneur IQ quiz with flying colors, it is probably safe to assume that while you have an entrepreneurial bent, you likely do not know everything you will need to become successful. That is true for most self-employed people. So the suggestion here is that you begin to brush up on both the subjects that seem interesting to you and the ones that scare you. If finances are not your strong suit, then dig in. As a small business owner, you will inevitably wear many hats. It is not uncommon, especially at the beginning, for the founder to be the president, accountant, marketing wizard, and salesperson, all rolled into one so it helps to get a broad understanding of what it takes to run a business. It would also be smart to start to read some business magazines every month. Periodicals like Home Business Magazine, Entrepreneur, and Inc. are chock full of easy to understand articles intended to make you a success. Experience. Finally, no education would be complete without some practical hands-on experience. This can take two forms. First, if you want to open an antique store, for example, you would be wise to work at one. If you already have that sort of hands-on experience in your chosen industry, then skip the rest of this paragraph. But if you have never actually worked in a business like the one you want to start, you are strongly advised to do just that. Your entrepreneurial dream can wait six months while you gain the sort of experience that can make or break your new business. Working in a business like the one you want to create will teach you things that no books can impart. It is a critical step. Second, you need to find some business owners in your desired field with whom to talk. If you stay in your own town, finding entrepreneurs to talk to in your potential industry may be difficult. They will likely view you as a potential competitor, rightly so, and thus be reluctant to share their insights with you. Therefore, it would be much smarter to go to a nearby town. Find a few businesses similar to the one you want to start. Take the owners out for lunch and pick their brains. People love to talk about themselves. Find out everything you can about their business. What do they like most about it? What do they like least? How much did it cost to start? How much can you expect to make? Where do they advertise? If they were starting over, what would they do differently? No one knows this business, whatever it is, like the owners do. You would be hard pressed to find better, more pertinent information than that from those small business owners who are already doing what you dream of doing. This informal MBA can reap tremendous benefits. By the time you are ready to start your own business, you will have a thorough understanding of the risks and rewards of what you are getting into. Doing this initial research will take time for sure, but if you follow this plan, you can be assured that when you finally do open your doors, you will have reduced your risk to the extent possible and thus your chances of success 
will be much greater.